The 6 o'clock news starts right now. We begin tonight with a live look outside with live cam here in San Antonio. We've caught a bit of a break the last couple of days when it comes to the rain. Little to none of the heavier stuff they've been dealing with to the south and east, but scattered showers expected to increase as we head into the evening. Katie Blake has the details on that and a look at how the weekend is shaping up coming up in just a bit. Starting this weekend, Bear County Sheriff's deputies will begin patrolling the Riverwalk after the Sheriff's Office says downtown business leaders requested a more pronounced presence there. An industry group says restaurants are dealing with a variety of problems caused by people experiencing homelessness. Garen Berger talks with uh, one local business owner about the issues he says he's had. Bob Buchanan's the original Mexican restaurant. It's long one of the city's most picturesque tourist destinations, the Riverwalk. And he says lately there have been some less than picturesque scenes. Urating, defecating. Cannon says people who appear to be homeless also frequently swipe food or money off the tables. And the head of the local chapter of the Texas Restaurant Association says other businesses are having issues too. Having uh, homeless people taking baths in the river, sleeping in front of their businesses, panhandling in front of their businesses, it just it's been devastating for, for them. Buchanan, for one, thinks there's not enough park police presence. Look around in this block, up that block, do you see a park ranger? And the hope is the presence of deputies will help deter some of the problems. They can pass through here, they have every right to pass through here, but when they're camping out, you know, these operators do have a problem with that. In a Facebook post, the sheriff's office said deputies will have materials to help the homeless population find resources, and mental health deputies will be assigned to help support the extra patrols. Uh, deputy's presence won't exactly be overwhelming. It's just going to be on Saturdays for now and just three deputies per shift with some cadets. Additionally, as far as officer presence goes, an SAPD spokeswoman said that issue has not been raised in recent conversations with downtown business owners. And she noted that frequent issues that officers deal with downtown, such as noise violations or aggressive panhandling, are city ordinances, which sheriff's deputies cannot enforce. Live in the Riverwalk, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Garrett. Jury selection begins today in the trial of a man charged with stabbing another man to death downtown back in 2019. Ricardo Lawson is accused of stabbing 26-year-old Marcus McGee Sims several times during an argument. McGee Sims was found in the 200 block of East Commerce. He was rushed to a hospital but died from his injuries. Police say surveillance video from that night shows Lawson and McGee Sims get into a confrontation. If convicted, Lawson faces 5 to 99 years in prison. A crash on the northwest side overnight, leaving two men in very different positions. One is in the hospital, but also facing criminal charges. The other is trying to figure out how to fix the damage. As Katrina Weber reports tonight, the crash left a whole trail of destruction along the 6600 block of UTSA Boulevard. San Antonio police work to make sense of a situation out of control. They say a driver speeding down UTSA Boulevard after two this morning lost control of his car and plowed right through a utility pole. The car, which also had a female passenger, then scraped along a sidewalk, tore up landscaping, and slammed into a fence about 500 yards away. In the middle of my sleep, I heard a very loud noise. I opened my eyes and then the electric went off, the lights went off. And I was super tired. I just continued sleeping. I didn't care. Baha Batan, already exhausted from working on his PhD, found out he now has to add car repairs to his load. Flying debris did a number on his Mercedes parked at the Avalon Place apartments nearby. Still, it wasn't his biggest concern. That was my very first question that I asked whenever I came here, right? Yeah. Were, the, were the people safe? Were they all right? When you look at all this damage, you would think someone had to have been critically hurt. Police say the man and woman were taken to a hospital, but their injuries were not nearly as bad as they could have been. It took CPS Energy crews hours to repair the pole. Patan says this is not the first crash he's seen here. It's, it's maybe because people don't see the little curves in the middle of the street at night times, or they're intoxicated. Who knows? Police say this appears to be a case of intoxication. They say once the driver's out of the hospital, he will face charges. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. 
If you've been worried about how much time your kids and even yourself have spent in front of screens, your instincts are right. During the pandemic, nearsightedness is becoming more and more common. Ursula Perry explains myopia is on the rise in kids, and you can blame cell phones, computer monitors, even TV screens for the growing problem. No doubt about it, the COVID quarantine has meant isolation and boredom for kids. And this is a very familiar scene for many families. Every time I see them, they're either on the phone or on, the, on their computer. But all that screen time may be leading to more cases of nearsightedness. That's when you can see things up close, but not far away. In the U.S., only 25% of the population suffered from nearsightedness in the 70s. Today, it's 42%. Experts say one big reason is kids are getting less natural sunlight. Focusing your eyes in the daylight can delay the onset of nearsightedness. And the blue light from screens can cause another problem that doctors call digital eye strain. So what's that? Vision becomes blurry, eyes become fatigued, sometimes red. It's very frequent to start getting headaches. A Canadian study revealed that during the COVID lockdown, Eight-year-olds spend an average of more than five hours a day in front of screens for fun, with more screen time needed for their school. Experts say try the 20-20-20 practice with your kids. That means you take regular breaks every 20 minutes to look at something 20 feet away for 20 seconds. The World Health Organization says at this rate, about half of the world's entire population will be myopic or nearsighted by the year 2050. That's why researchers are saying one thing you can also do is make sure your kids get out of their rooms and enjoy the outdoors as much as possible. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. As more people continue to travel, the city of San Antonio is pushing for everyone to get vaccinated and making it easier for travelers at the airport to get the shot. Yesterday was the sixth pop-up clinic at San Antonio International Airport. With another one scheduled for Friday, Dr. Anita Curian, Assistant Director of Metro Health's Communicable Disease Division, says anyone traveling through San Antonio has the opportunity to get vaccinated, no appointment needed. While people wait in the baggage claim, Metro Health teams will approach travelers to find out if they want to get vaccinated. They won't be asked for citizenship status, legal status, or residency status. With the economy reopening, especially in this climate of uh, high uh, global migration, it's important that we ensure that every single person who's walking, coming into our community um, is vaccinated. This weekend, top Mexican soccer teams will be playing in the Alamo Dome, and that means people traveling from out of town for the big games will have the opportunity to get vaccinated. Texas lawmakers going back to work in Austin today for the special legislative session. State senators and representatives tackling Governor Greg Abbott's high priority agenda items that were still left undone at the end of the 140 day regular session. Abbott announced his agenda for this 30 day emergency session, which which includes border security, voting rights, social media censorship, critical race theory and transgender youth in sports. Take a live look outside with live cam on this Thursday, awaiting more rain. Normally in July, I wouldn't say this, but rain, rain, please go away, Katie. <laughs> I, yes, some folks, especially western, northwestern Bear County, had way too much of it Monday. Folks down closer to the coast have had too much of it since Tuesday. At the airport today, though, only a trace of rain, a high of 86. I mean, I've, yeah, too much rain, but it could be so much hotter this time of year. It was a bit hotter out in Del Rio. Your high temperature 96 with a bit more sunshine because again today, a lot of the more widespread rain has been focused down closer to the Gulf Coast and now also between San Antonio and Houston. Some flash flood warnings do continue down near the Texas Gulf Coast and we are starting to see some more widespread rain push into places like Lavaca County and Hallettsville. That likely will happen this hour. And in around San Antonio, plenty of clouds, but just just a couple little showers there uh, right near the heart of downtown. This evening, muggy overcast with some scattered rain starting to fill in later this evening. It's not going to be a constant rain all evening, but I do expect we'll see radar uh, have some scattered activity on it this evening, and that will continue through the day on Friday as well. We'll talk about that and get you ready for the weekend, which, Tim, I think you'll like the weekend forecast a little bit more. We'll talk about it all coming up. Myra. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Katie.
Even though the waters have receded from the roads and the usual trouble spots after heavy rains, the damage may have already been done. Our Samuel King with what's being done to get those roads fixed next. Coming up tonight at 7 o'clock, we are taking a deep dive into the five-year-old murder of a San Antonio Police Department detective and the trial of the man accused of killing him. The murder trial of Otis McCain is set to begin next week. Tonight, Erica Hernandez will break down the events leading up to this trial and speak with a legal analyst to discuss what could happen once this trial begins. The trial of Otis McCain preview will be live streamed on KSAT.com and on the KSAT TV streaming app available on Apple TV, Amazon Fire Stick, Roku and any way you stream. We're at Rubens Auto Repair in Leon Valley. Tonight on the Night Beat, they're going to show us how to find out if your car's had water damage and what you need to do if it does. This week's rainy weather causing problems on the roads right now and perhaps more in the future. Our Samuel King joins us now. And Samuel, rain and flood water can really damage roads pretty badly. Yeah, that's right, Tim and Myra. When it comes to heavy rain, the more water on a roadway, the higher the potential for the pavement to become loose, leading to damage and potholes, big and small. Crews spent much of the day Thursday back out at Highway 90 at Leon Creek, clearing the frontage road of construction and other debris swept onto the roadway by floodwaters. The high water left parts of the roadway damaged. UTSA engineering professor Samir Dasuki says water that doesn't drain quickly can do a number on roadways, weakening the asphalt. That makes that glue becomes weaker with, with time. And with the presence of water from the rainfall that we experienced the last few days, that accelerate damage. He says this can be a major but temporary issue in construction zones because there's not as much drainage. Uh, but uh, no matter what, uh, it is always safer to turn around and not going through uh, an accumulation of water on the roads because uh, sometimes the water current might be stronger, especially that the water is going to lift the vehicle up and then having the water flow might drift the vehicles aside. Dr. Tosuki says it's important for drivers who see potholes or other road damage to report it quickly. The faster you go and treat the potholes and fix them, the better, because you prevent the damage to expand to other areas in the pavement and even to go further deeper in the layers underneath. And here's how you can do that in the city of San Antonio. You can call 311 or use the 311 SA app on state controlled highways. You can file a report at www.text.gov and we'll have a link to that exact site on our website, ksat.com this evening. As for traffic this evening on the west side, this is 90 at Leon Creek. Things looking a lot better than they did earlier this week, uh, but we're still having some issues there on that frontage road. They didn't quite get it open, so you can still see those barricades there. So watch out uh, for that. The other uh, frontage road there, the eastbound road, uh, does appear to be open. Traffic moving, even via buses moving there this morning. Uh, we've been talking about the uh, heavy rain mostly out to the east, so this is a look at some of the road conditions. You will, will run into some wet weather in I-10, uh, Gonzales, and here even into Bear County now, some uh, rain showers. And have some delays here on the southeast side, both I-37 and Loop 410 on the southeast side, seeing some major delays here. You're down to 12 miles per hour. You usually don't see it, at least in this part of town this time of day, so that is unusual. Also still have some delays here uh, downtown, down to 11 miles per hour downtown, so that's something uh, to look out for. I put that in, and that is not the correct times. So don't worry about that <laughs> right there. But let's take a look here downtown. This is 35 at Martin. You can kind of see the slow traffic, and we'll continue to keep an eye on things this evening, guys. All right, thanks, Samuel. Look outside with Sky 12. While the temperatures are lovely for this time of year, it's also today's also given us a chance to dry out in some parts. Mm -hmm. We got more rain to talk about, Katie. Yeah, I do think tomorrow, Friday, is going to feel like a rainier day than what we saw today. With that low pressure system that's down near the Gulf finally moving a bit tomorrow, kind of ringing itself out, but that'll bring us, I think, a slightly better chance of rain on Friday. So I do want to start with our rainfall potential heading into the next 48 hours. This contour here, the bright colors you see, that covers the next 48 hours, but the majority 
of rain is going to fall in the next 24 hours tonight and during the day on Friday. The highest totals will be between San Antonio and Houston, technically just out of our viewing area. We extend over to Hallettsville, Lavaca County, and then Houston picks up counties east of Lavaca County. But if you're in Hallettsville, even down to Cuero and DeWitt, depending on how heavy rain bands set up tonight, tomorrow morning, you could be on the fringe of seeing these high rainfall totals over the next 24 hours. But generally, as you move west back toward I-35 in San Antonio, rainfall totals will drop off in and around San Antonio and Bear County. One to two inches of rain is a safe bet. What we could see some locally higher totals across the city and the county because we do expect some heavier pockets of rain at times, especially tonight into the day tomorrow. Currently, a pretty big spread in our temperatures all the way from 77 in Gonzales to 83 here in San Antonio up to 96 in Del Rio with more sunshine. Uh, the rain today again has been down to the southeast of San Antonio, the more widespread rain for the most part. I do believe on that sky 12 shot. We caught this teeny shower looking south from just north of downtown. This is really just some light rain that's south of downtown, generally south of Highway 90. Not much left to that shower there. We do have some nice little pop up uh, showers with some heavier rain north of Uvalde there and also all the way down to Maverick County and Eagle Pass with the more widespread rain uh, is generally off to the east of Highway 77 here in Lavaca County down to Victoria. This is trying to drift off to the west and we could see some heavier rain fill in over Hallettsville, Lavaca County and even Quero and DeWitt County over the next hour or so. Flash flood warnings do continue down near places like Rockport uh, and south of Victoria down to the Gulf Coast where they have seen a a ton of rain since Tuesday, technically in some spots, especially near Rockport and Fulton, close to a foot of rain since Tuesday. So it's not going to take much rain at all for flash flooding to occur down near the Texas Gulf Coast. So they are under a flash flood watch, meaning flash flooding is possible. But we've also had a couple of our uh, counties off to the west, including San Antonio and Bear County, be added into this flash flood watch. This will be in place until tomorrow evening. And again, if you see your county here in green, that means we could have some isolated flash flooding issues there through tomorrow evening because we do anticipate some pockets of heavier rain that um, could aggravate already saturated ground and lead to some flash flooding issues. The big culprit here is a low pressure system that is centered down near Corpus Christi and the Gulf Coast this evening. What happens tomorrow, this starts to move west and it'll start to get stretched apart just a little bit and weaken. However, even as that happens, that's going to keep rain around uh, through the day on Friday. This particular future cast model paints some very heavy bands of rain south of the Houston area down near the Gulf Coast overnight through early tomorrow. A couple of these bands could be around places like Hallettsville, Cuero, even Gonzales, so we'll have to watch that closely. If those heavy rain bands set up, we could have some flash flooding develop as early as uh, early tomorrow morning off well to the east of I-35. Through tomorrow afternoon, as this low continues to hang around, we'll see scattered off and on rain in the forecast and pockets of heavy rain possible. Again, we could see that lead to some isolated flash flooding issues as far west as parts of Bear County through tomorrow evening. So just keep in mind tomorrow, if you're out and about, we could have some of those areas of heavier rain that could lead to some isolated flash flooding issues. We'll be here to keep you updated. Overall, though, tomorrow off and on rain, it's going to be a pretty gloomy day, but we will see some improvement heading into the weekend. Spotty rain Saturday, but overall a chance to dry off. We'll warm up a little bit more as well, guys. All right. Thanks, Katie. Mm -hmm. All right, Greg, the Bucks and the Suns getting ready for game two tonight. And what adjustments will Milwaukee make to get back in this series? What will Phoenix do to kind of keep them a little arm apart here, if you would? When we come back here, the NBA Finals resume tonight right here on KSAT 12. And this is why you have to love hockey. What a press conference following the Stanley Cup Finals. <laughs> Coming up. <laughs> Here we go. The NBA Finals resume tonight with the Suns looking to sweep the Bucks in Phoenix after taking game one of this best of seven series, 118 to 105. The Suns are five and a half point favors going into tonight's game two after they were six point favors in game one. When play resumes tonight, the Suns will be down a man. Dario Saric 
critical bench player for Phoenix is done for the rest of this season, maybe even the start of next season after he tore his anterior cruciate ligament. His right knee happened in the first quarter when he's going up against Brooke Lopez with help limp to the locker room in the process. Sarge was averaging almost five points and two and a half rebounds at 11 minutes per game for Phoenix. But now with the Suns possessing a big three attack, they may not need him. Sure, Chris Paul was a beast, followed by Devin Booker in game one, but DeAndre Ayton has stepped up at center. He finished with 22 points, 19 rebounds, shot 80% for the field, only the second player to do that in the finals behind Kareem Abdul-Jabbar back in 1971. Aiden credits conversations throughout the season with both Chris Paul and Devin Booker have elevated his game. It's just the respect level. Like you say, we all got on each other, had candid conversations where, you know, we had to adjust, but candid conversations lead to wins. And, you know, it started to be great communication and constructive criticism. And we just all take it into a positive and play it together, you know, um, bring it to the other guys. And they see how we are playing as a unit and it's contagious. That's about it. All right, in order for the Milwaukee Bucks to steal game two tonight in Phoenix, two things must happen. They have to find a way to stop or at least limit Chris Paul and get more production out of Drew Holiday. Paul took full advantage of the Bucks' defense's switches to light up Milwaukee for 32 points at 36 years of age, including 16 of those coming in the third quarter. And it starts with Drew Holiday on defense trying to slow down the 16-year veteran. And on offense, where Holiday was limited to just 10 points and missed all four of his three-point attempts in game one. In the two games that Giannis Antetokounmpo did not play in the Eastern Conference Finals, Holiday combined for 50 points and 22 assists. Now with the Greek freak back, head coach Mike Budenholzer has to find a way to also get Holiday the ball, who is not making any excuses. I think I had a bad shooting night. Um, I had a lot of opportunities to, to make layups and shots, and, and they weren't falling. Uh, again, I, I think I do a little bit more than scoring, just getting people plays and, and, and threes and driving to the basket. But me personally, I didn't shoot well tonight. All right, all resumes tonight, 8 p.m. tip-off. Night beat on a little bit later tonight because it's all live on KSAT 12. Tomorrow night, San Antonio's Hector Tanahara Jr. will fight after a year-and-a-half layoff. Part of that was due to him contracting the coronavirus prior to his last scheduled bout. But El Finito is back, ready to battle it out in his 20th career fight in California. He'll face Mexico's William Zapeta, who's 22-0 with 20 knockouts. I sparred him one time at the Olympic Training Center when we were like 15 or 16 years old, so I kind of know how he fights a little bit. He's a uh, a uh, lefty, a come forward fighter, but uh, and he has a great record, like you said, uh, 20 knockouts out of 22 fights. But but I don't think he's fought the opposition that I have. I fought, you know, way more tough fighters than him. Tanahara's fight can be seen tomorrow on the zone, and if he wins, only will be 20. No, he'll also be the WBA Continental America's title belt. The Tampa Bay Lightning won the Stanley Cup for the second season in a row by eliminating the Montreal Canadiens four games to one. But everyone is talking about Nikita Kucherov's beer drinking shirtless post game press conference where he did not hold back. I didn't want to go back to Montreal, but they acted, the fans in Montreal, come on, they acted like they won the Stanley Cup last game. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Their final was last, last series. <laughs> That's what I love about hockey players. They're honest to a fault. Yeah. And you got to listen to the rest of that. It goes on forever. I can listen to it for 20 minutes. How many beers did he drink? I him? saw one there, but that doesn't <laughs> count how many he had before the press oh, conference. Oh, you saw. Yeah. yeah. So. Exactly. Thank you, right. Greg. Thanks, Greg. Our KSAT Q&A is up next. It is Thursday, so in today's KSAT Q&A, we are pleased to be joined by Dr. Ruth Bergren, infectious disease specialist with the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio. Good to see you, doctor. As always, we got some big news to start with here today. Uh, we've learned that Pfizer is looking to get clearance for a third shot. Talk to us about why they are looking for that and what that could potentially mean. So first, this isn't really a surprise, Myra. Um, we've been expecting to hear news about a booster dose for months. I've talked about it often on this segment, but uh, Pfizer has now announced that they plan to request emergency use authorization for that third dose from the FDA within the month. And it appears that the trigger for this is data. And there's been data from Pfizer and there's been data from the Health Department of Israel, which demonstrates that after about six months, you start to see waning immunity, lower levels of antibodies, 
and some higher reinfection rates. Now, this isn't meant to frighten anybody who got vaccinated more than six months ago, like me, for instance. Um, but what we know is that there's a higher risk of a reinfection despite full vaccination if six months have gone by since your second dose. And so what they're doing is requesting permission to start administering third doses of the same vaccine. Now, at the same time, they are investigating a, a changed vaccine that will account for some of the new variants, but that's not what they're asking for this EUA, this emergency use authorization for. They're going after approval to administer a third dose of the vaccine that uh, many of us have had already. So as we await word on that, we are also now hearing about clusters of people where there are unvaccinated communities across the United States, mainly in the southeastern U.S., including portions of Texas, where people just aren't getting the shot and are very low vaccination rates. There's some real concerns that those people who are unvaccinated in those communities could impact all of us across the entire nation. That's true. And so the unvaccinated people who get sick can actually impact the vaccinated people. Why is that? Because the more people that get infected, the more chance that the virus will mutate again and become even wilier at evading immune response. So besides the fact that it could cause surges, which stress our healthcare systems, and that affects everybody, um, the people who are getting sick from COVID because they're unvaccinated um, could wind up propagating more resistant uh, versions of the virus. So it's just, one of many, many reasons why we want to continue to invite, encourage, um, and applaud everybody who, who decides to come and get their COVID vaccine. It's a good thing to do for yourself and for everybody else. There is some uh, news out of Dallas County, meanwhile, that's grabbing a lot of attention. The health authority there has announced that Dallas County has reached herd immunity, which is a term we talked about so much about earlier on in this pandemic. So when people hear that news, what do you think they should take away from that announcement? And is there any kind of word of caution with that news? Well, I think um, anytime a community has gotten more than 70% fully vaccinated, that's what I would call herd immunity, there's full vaccination of 70%, there should be some celebration for sure. Um, but that doesn't mean we throw all precautions to the wind as we continue to see pockets and surges around the country. And um, remember that there are many people who are very vulnerable. So folks who've had solid organ transplants, kidney transplants, heart transplants, those people are especially vulnerable. People who take medicine that suppresses their immune system because they have an autoimmune disease, like people with rheumatoid arthritis or people with multiple sclerosis, those people are vulnerable even when they've been fully vaccinated. So I think that people need to um, not just throw all caution to the wind, but uh, continue to encourage um, vulnerable people to be vaccinated, the people around the vulnerable folks to be vaccinated and, and stay tuned, remain situationally aware of what's happening with the variants. Do you see any point to where the shot might become mandated? I know there's been a lot of concern about people not getting the vaccine, but the federal government has not wanted to wade into the waters of mandating that vaccine. Would, what kind of trouble would that cause? And it, it, would it just be easier if businesses and schools were to say, we're gonna make it hard for you to, to do things if you're not vaccinated? Yeah, I don't envision a, a federal mandate and most um, legal advisors and ethicists uh, don't see that coming either, but it makes a lot of sense for individual businesses and certain industries like the healthcare industry to uh, consider um, very difficult to opt out or true mandates. And there's been a precedent for immunizing people against flu. I mean, if I, if I don't get my flu vaccine every fall, I will lose my admission privileges at, at University Hospital. So there's a mandate there. Um, we're mandated to get our hepatitis B vaccine. It's really hard to get out of it. And so I think that considering that healthcare providers put vulnerable people at risk every single day, every single time we see a patient, it makes a lot of sense to require such healthcare providers to be vaccinated. Um, whether it's necessary to mandate that across the board is 
The answer is probably not, uh, but, but we should continue to educate people about why vaccination makes sense and encourage people to get vaccinated. We want to get to a viewer question before we go here. We had someone write into us asking that they have uh, heard from other people anecdotally that they've had COVID in the past, so they're not getting the vaccine now. What is your advice on that very topic? What do you recommend? So we know that um, immunity from, from COVID infection uh, can protect you for a time. And we have some data on population levels. We also know and it's well documented that there are people who've gotten sick with COVID after about 90 days following the resolution of their first COVID infection. So we know that that can happen. It's well documented. In addition, um, we have good data from Brazil where uh, af after the first round of COVID infections there, um, things began to simmer down and then they got their variant, that P1 variant, which has um, now been given a Greek letter name. Um, people who had recovered from COVID in Brazil got very sick um, with the variant. So these are all reasons why people who have recovered from COVID should not rest easy. They should get vaccinated and they shouldn't really wait more than about 90 days after their first vaccine to go and get that first shot. All right, Dr. Ruth Berggren, as always, thanks for being here. Most welcome. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. Taking a look at some things out here. This is a look at road conditions, uh, some a wet road conditions, particularly to the east. This sort of green has gone away here uh, in Seguin, but we are seeing some wet roads once you move into uh, Bear County here. Some delays on I-10 coming into downtown, especially there at the interchange with I-37 down to nine miles per hour. That's not like what we like to see. Also still watching some delays here in the southeast side, getting a little better on 37 southbound, but we're still uh, monitoring the situation on Loop 410 westbound. Uh, there's a crash there earlier, might be starting to clear up, so we're starting to see that uh, red there turn into orange, which is what we do like to see. Also take you back downtown, major slowdowns here on 35 southbound down to 12 miles per hour uh, in the downtown area. And we can kind of see this here uh, on the Transguide camera 37 and Jones, a slowdown there. So a lot going on this evening. We usually don't see it this busy at this time, but you know, with rain moving in and a lot of people going out and about, we are seeing some traffic issues this evening and we'll keep an eye on it through the end of the newscast, guys. All right, thank you, Samuel. Maybe a lot more people looking forward to the weekend. We're not there yet. We got to get through some rain chances first, Katie. Yes, weekend looks better for lower rain chances. Uh, I think we're going to warm up a little bit more heading into the weekend as well. That's the trade off. We've got all these clouds out there. That's helping to keep our temperatures down in the 70s and 80s for a lot of us at the airport right now. 83 mostly cloudy, a decent breeze out there. And we did have a shower moving through Central Bear County over the last 30 45 minutes that has really fizzled out, uh, but we're going to bring back rain chances tonight and during the day tomorrow. Off and on showers will be possible on your Friday, but again, the weekend not nearly as rainy. We'll talk about all of that and more coming up in just a bit. Want to take a trip out of the country? If you need a passport, you may be in for quite a wait. We're talking months. The State Department says if you're applying for a new passport or renewing one, you could wait up to 18 weeks to get it done. You can cut the wait to 12 weeks if you pay extra for expedited processing. Officials blame the longer wait on increased demand, a shortage of appointments, and delays with the U.S. Postal Service. That means you need to apply now if you have international travel plans in late fall or early next spring. Ooh. Oh, my husband's not watching. He's been trying to get me to renew mine for Ooh, like oh boy. two months. And <laughs> Time is a ticket. I haven't done it yet. Sorry, I'll get right on that. <laughs> um, well, travel just hasn't been on my mind. I'm like, we're not going anywhere. And I you imagine that's busy. the way it, it's been for a lot of people, right? Yeah. Everyone now is saying, oh, okay, we can skedaddle. All we right. can go somewhere. Yeah, I guess everybody at the same time. That's why there's the backlog in the passports. Uh, unfortunately, I feel I feel bad for anyone that came down to the Texas Gulf Coast this week for vacation. Not great beach 
weather, unfortunately. We will see some improvement, though, in the weekend. So if your weekend plans want to take you down to the beach, uh, you'll have a bit better luck there as far as the rain goes. Looks like our latest uh, refresh of our radar here, our radar data, has gone out. Uh, so I apologize for that. But I left the loop on here so you can kind of see how that rain is behaving out there this evening. We're starting to see a swath of this more widespread, heavier rain slowly drift off to the west, uh, closer to places like Hallettsville in Lavaca County down to Victoria, and this will continue to slowly move off to the west this evening. We've also got a couple of really spotty showers uh, just north of Uvalde there all the way down to Eagle Pass. So some spotty rain out there this evening, and we're going to hold on to a chance of some scattered rain tonight into most of the day on Friday. 83 at the airport, cooler off to the east where we have that more widespread rain at 77 in Gonzales. Meanwhile, 86, Uvalde 96 in Del Rio with more sunshine this afternoon. Really muggy all across the board. Our dew points are in the 60s and 70s. That is feeling oppressively humid. But we've got a decent breeze. Our winds are about 5 to 15 miles per hour. And here in San Antonio, they're out of the east, but some places have a northeasterly wind direction because the center of circulation of the slow pressure system down near Corpus that has our, our wind direction uh, bit different than how we would normally see it this time of year. Typically right off the Gulf of Mexico, keeping that humidity nice and high. But we do have center of circulation down near Corpus with this low pressure system that has been producing all that flooding rain down near the Gulf Coast since about Tuesday. And again, heavy rain is continuing between Houston and Gonzales this evening. So there's the center of that low. It's going to take a jog off to the northwest during the day tomorrow. As that happens, it's going to get kind of stretched apart. It'll really weaken, but it's still going to take Take all this rain here and even some rain out in the Gulf of Mexico and move it inland over parts of south and southeast Texas. And that's what's going to prolong our rain chances into the day on Friday. So here's the rainfall over the next 48 hours. Most of this, though, is going to fall in the next 24 hours. And as that low moves west, it's going to bring a lot of rain between San Antonio and Houston over the next day or so. Highest rainfall totals uh, will likely be just outside of our viewing area. So east of Hallettsville and Lavaca County there Southwest of Houston, we could see some rainfall totals well above five inches of rain, maybe even getting closer to eight inches of rain over the next day. Then as you move west, when rainfall totals will drop off, uh, places like Gonzales down to a portion of DeWitt, Quero area could see around two inches of rain, maybe a little bit more back closer to I-35 in San Antonio, one to two inches of rain with some locally higher totals. So we do have a flash flood watch that will be in place until tomorrow evening in advance of this heavy and locally uh, locally heavy rain. Uh, and this is mainly for areas east of I-35 where those rainfall totals are expected to be higher. But San Antonio technically in Bear County is under that flash flood watch. A couple of pockets of heavy rain could aggravate some already saturated ground through the day on Friday. So that's why we are under that flash flood watch and we'll be monitoring for any flooding issues during the day on Friday. Through about 730 tomorrow morning, again, heaviest rain with some flooding issues, likely well east of our area, but some scattered rain in town. And we'll hold on to a chance of some off and on rain throughout the day on Friday, even into this time tomorrow evening, with rain chances really becoming more isolated tomorrow night and into the day on Saturday. Here's lunchtime on Saturday. A couple of little spotty showers will be possible, but overall we'll get a decent chance to dry off this weekend after one more kind of gloomy day tomorrow. But with the clouds, we'll keep our highs in the 80s for your Friday, warming up a little bit more this weekend and early next week. Guys, thanks, Katie. Mm -hmm. In case you missed it, up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. We don't ask for the citizenship status or legal status or residency status. Dr. Anita Curian, Assistant Director of Metro Health's Communicable Disease Division, says anyone traveling through San Antonio has the opportunity to get vaccinated. We know unvaccinated travels are at increased risk for exposure to SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is a virus that causes COVID-19. The case of two missing children that we first told you about earlier today, San Antonio police say those children have now been found. 10-year-old Angel Dancy and 6-year-old Devin Dancy were both reported missing around noontime today. Details of these disappearances 
were not known, but police do say they're now with family members. Their update now on a fatal standoff from earlier this week. A man fatally shot in an exchange of gunfire with San Antonio police officers has now been identified as 28 year old Eduardo Amesquita. He died Monday after he fired shots at a KSAT news crew at the scene of a house fire over on the west side. Vice President Kamala Harris announcing Thursday the Democratic National Committee's plans to invest an additional $25 million in its I Will Vote initiative. According to the nonpartisan Brennan Center for Justice, since the 2020 elections, lawmakers in 17 mostly GOP-led states have already enacted 28 new laws that at least in part restrict voters' access to the polls. And overseas, an announcement from Tokyo officials at the upcoming Olympic Games will have no spectators in the stands. The city itself under a state of emergency due to rising COVID numbers. From a live stream on KSAT.com starting at 7 o'clock tonight, previewing the trial of Otis McCain, our Erica Hernandez doing that live stream. Erica, this is the trial of a man accused of killing an SAPD detective, Benjamin Marconi, several years ago. Tell us what we can expect from this live stream tonight. We're really going to dive into the legal aspect of this of this case and what the prosecution and what the defense may be doing and what their strategy may be. So we're going to speak to a legal analyst, a local defense attorney and really break down this case. All right, so that is coming up, KSAT.com, the KSAT TV app as well. You can check that out starting here in just a few minutes at 7 o'clock. Thanks for being with us tonight for the News at 6. And the Night Beat will be on late after the NBA Finals.